The Being an Engineer podcast is a repository for industry knowledge and a tool through which engineers learn about and connect with relevant companies, technologies, people, resources, and opportunities. Enjoy the show. And we built 10 things that didn't work. And then I was down on the production floor with a, with a jigsaw cutting out holes because I screwed up my design. Everything that I've learned where I'm at today, I learned from others and I learned by failure and I learned by doing that. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Being an Engineer podcast. Our guest today is Ian McCathern, who for over 15 years has been helping cutting edge companies design highly complex products, including artificial hearts, blood pumps, and class three medical devices. Products Ian has designed are in Times Square, the Disney parks, the Smithsonian, and implanted in people around the world. Ian, I've been super excited to talk with you, and I appreciate you joining me for the show today. Thank you so much for having me. So what made you decide to become an engineer? Uh, When I was growing up, I used to watch a lot of MacGyver and and shows like that. Uh, There was a show called 321 Contact. Um, that I remember watching and I, um, from a young age, always wanted to, knew I wanted to make things and invent things. So when I was really young, I used to say I wanted to be an inventor. And then as I grew up, I um, realized that the best way to to get there was to be an engineer. That's awesome. I loved MacGyver growing up. <laughs> I remember watching the first uh, the first episode I ever saw, and there was this cool spy guy that was, you know, jumping out of planes or using chewing gum to detonate a wall or whatever he was doing. But uh, that is uh, an answer that I don't hear nearly as much as is, uh, I think we should hear. I bet a lot of engineers out there uh, cut their teeth on, on MacGyver at a young age, not just Legos, but, but MacGyver as well. So you went to the Colorado School of Mines, and I've heard a lot of good things about this place. What can you tell me about the Colorado School of Mines as an engineering university? Sure. Uh, I can say it's really engineering focused. And, and they bring in a lot of faculty that were, you know, actually practicing engineers in their careers and um, not necessarily um, your typical PhD, but folks have been out in, in industry for quite a few years and then they bring them back as adjunct faculty to teach. And there were a lot of um, things in my education that I only realized years later in my profession that's Oh, that's why they taught me that. That's why they were so adamant about that, that kind of thing. And so, um, I think it's a very pragmatic education, but also uh, very difficult. There's a lot of, um, coursework and a lot of credits you need to graduate. Um, and so I, I usually say that it, it makes it or the, the way, the rigor of, of the program and everything makes it so you just really have to want to be an engineer to graduate. And so I think that kind of self selects folks that if, if you, if you end up graduating from there, it means you really wanted it. All of the classes are weeder classes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, can you think of any specific examples? You mentioned that years later, you might have had an epiphany or a realization. That's why they taught me this thing, or that's why they wanted me to understand this thing. Can you think of any specific examples of uh, those Absolutely. Yeah. There was a, a robotics class that I took. And in the robotics class, um, we did a whole bunch of different things. But one of the interesting um, things was they had a large industrial robot arm with a welding um, head on it, like a MIG welder. And there were a lot of um, questions and a lot of coursework around uh, making that thing work in the, in the kinematics specifically. And at the time, we were doing all this matrix math to, to figure out where the end effector of this seven axis robot arm is as in relation to each axis or each joint location and angle and, and all that. And at the time, it just seemed like, why would I ever want to do this? And then, uh, in my, in my career, as I got into robotics and automation, um, I use it all the time. And it's one of the fundamental things that's a part of your control loop, even if you're servoing over uh, around position and then you want to be make full use of your entire robotic axes of motion. And, and so it ends up being a, a fundamental thing that's really, really helpful to understand why it works and, and how it works. That's a wonderful example. And that might be an answer to one of the answers to the next question I'm going to ask you, which is, Having professors at your university who were themselves practicing engineers, how do you think that influenced the curriculum? 
Uh, quite a bit. And a lot of the, uh, we even had a program called Epics, which was structured almost like a, the bid cycle you have in a lot of engineering service companies where somebody would come to the program a lot of times outside of the university and say that I have a problem I would like the, uh, a student group to solve. And this was actually a, a requirement of graduating, right? It was a class we had to take. And then uh, you would have a small interdisciplinary group of students, mechanical, electrical, um, and a lot of times software and, and some other folks, and you would work together to create a, what is essentially a bid and a, and a program to figure out how to solve that engineering problem. You would work with the client to get them bought into it and then build a program, build a um, schedule around that and go do that work and then create a proof of concept um, prototype at the end that you then deliver to the client or the customer. And it's interesting that a lot of the, the projects were in the gamut because the School of Mines is, it, it's not just mechanical electrical engineering. It goes across the board to geophysics, mining, um, petroleum engineering. And so there were projects that were really interesting. And one of the projects I ended up doing was with the Coors Brewery nearby where they, they had a certain amount of, um, alcohol through the, their brewing process that just disappeared and they didn't know where it went. And so we worked with them very closely, toured the entire plant and went into, um, the brewery and, and put in actual sensors along the key points in the, in the brewing process that we thought, um, might give us some more information, analyzed all that data, and then provided them an answer at the end of the uh, semester. That's awesome. What what a cool experience that must have been as a student, especially to have the opportunity to go through all of those different steps along the, proc- the, 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 along the project, especially the quoting step. That's really interesting. I, yeah. I, I've heard about um, universities that, that will have, you know, some hands on academics curriculum, but I don't think I've heard of a class where the students got an opportunity to quote something. What a great idea for a university to do. And it really introduces you to the business of doing engineering, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because we can't just, um, uh, build things all day just for fun. There, there has to be some revenue attached at, at the end of it. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we, unfortunately, I wish we could keep going. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, unless you're the hacksmith who who just gets to do cool things all the time without worrying about budget. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he does. Yeah. All right. Well, you've designed things that are in Times Square, the Disney parks, and the Smithsonian. Can you tell us what are some of those items and, and how did you get the opportunity to design for these, these world-recognized organizations? Sure. Um, so I'll start with the, the first one on your list, Times Square. I worked, uh, was working for a audio video, um, design and build company, um, based out of Colorado. And basically they work for like, uh, AV installers and, uh, home theater installers and people that put big home theaters on yachts and in conference rooms. And, uh, they got their start actually. Um, the founder of the company was working as a uh, contractor for, uh, the U.S. government at NORAD. Uh, in Colorado Springs, Cheyenne Mountain. And they have a, a big situation room. And it's a lot like in that movie War Games, where there's a big projector on the wall and it shows like the nuclear missiles coming from Russia to attack the US. And they had a, a back, this was back quite a few years ago, where they had very specific projectors. And the um, projectors were really expensive, hanging from the ceiling. And they had a requirement that they needed to be able to change the bulbs in the projector in less time than it take a, took a nuclear missile to launch from, from Russia and come to the US. And so they, the, the owner of the company came up with this projector lift that lowered the projector down from the ceiling. And now these are common products that you can buy on like Monoprice and, and things like cool. that. Um, but he invented that and then parlayed it into, an, into a whole, co- whole company that built products like that, like AV accessories and, okay. and things like that. And so anyway, um, they did uh, a lot of work with things uh, like the Disney parks and then also um, uh, Samusa, which is a company in, in Times Square. And what's interesting about this business is they, they call it the street furniture business. So if you walk around to any kind of a newsstand or a phone booth or a, a newspaper receptacle, there's ads on them, right? And those, those companies provide things like bus stops. Th- those companies provide all of that for free to the city in exchange for the ad revenue. And so companies go in and they just give the city uh, all new bus stops, 250 bus stops, and then they just collect the ad revenue from that. Well, in New York City, we have those newsstands, right, where the newsies sell their 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 newspapers and packs of gum and stuff in, in Times Square. And so they have a big poster on the back that's typically like movie posters. And they have people go out and change out these posters every week. And um, this company um, was making so much from the ad revenue. Um, and this was, again, quite a few years ago when LCD TVs just came out that they wanted to replace the entire posters on these things with giant video wall LCD displays. 
And uh, the challenge uh, even today is that outdoors LCD displays are, are really not very bright because uh, through the LCD process, you're only actually letting through about 20% of the light you produce initially. And so um, even at the, at the time, the best TVs you could get really weren't able to um, be seen in direct daylight. And then also you have a cooling problem where you have to cool the whole system. And so um, we basically took um, brand new 65 inch LCD panels and um, took out the LCD panel and a couple of the filters behind it and threw away everything else. So at the time they had those CCFL backlights before LED backlights. And we just threw all that in the trash and we built our own LED backlight. And it was a, a three quarter of an inch solid aluminum plate behind the, the TV with 2000 golden watt, golden dragon, two LEDs, um, that, uh, are three Watts each. And we, it took so much power that we, um, just rectified 220 and directly drove the, the LEDs in series from 220 direct from the AC line. We just rectified it. And so, um, I mean, you, you needed welding glasses when you would turn these things on. Wow. And then, and then, um, the heat, the generated was just unreal because you can imagine it's just this giant aluminum plate getting really yeah. hot and we machined fins into it and did a whole bunch of thermal analysis. Um, so we ended up having to create, uh, the other thing is that all of the, there was a depth thing where there, the whole thing could only be six inches deep because that's how much room we had from the existing poster boxes. And so we couldn't find any off the shelf air conditioners that were, we needed about 20,000 BTUs of cooling per led panel. And so there weren't any off the shelf air. Con There's no 20,000 BTU air conditioner that's six inches thin. Right. And so we ended up, um, designing all the air and building the, all these air conditioner modules ourselves. And they were all modular. So you could slide in four 5,000 BTU air conditioner modules and swap them out as they needed to be replaced. And the limiting factor was the compressor. So in any air conditioner system, you have a compressor, right? And they typically have like a, a triangle feet on the bottom. And we had to cut off the bottom feet because that was too wide. But the compressor itself was about five and three quarter inch diameter. And that was the limiting factor. So we basically just bought the biggest compressor we could fit and then designed air conditioners around that. And so um, they, they installed those in, in at least half a dozen of, of the really high um, uh, income producing um, uh, newsstands in New York City um, when, when I was there. And, and it, was, it was a pretty cool project to be involved with. That's incredible. Well, okay. Listening to you talk, you are a true engineer. I mean, the quintessential engineer. This is what the School of Mines produces. I will never, ever be the caliber of engineer that you are. I can already tell by talking with you for like five minutes, which is fine. That's not what I'm trying to be. But you are, uh, I can already tell, just an incredible engineer. Uh when Thank you, you work, you're welcome. You're very welcome. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, just impressed with your depth of knowledge. The, the fact that you were able to spew out all those terms seamlessly without any pause just tells me how ingrained engineering fundamentals are in your brain, which is very, very impressive. Um, when, when, when you work on projects with others, do you find that, you might have to, um, uh, I don't, you're probably a very humble person and this might be hard for you to answer, but do you find that, um, it gets frustrating if you have to work with, with teams who maybe aren't quite as, as fast as you, uh, when it comes to engineering and development and, and how do you deal, uh, with those situations? It's a great question, uh, because it is a dynamic because oftentimes passion can be conflated or confused for, um, what, what you're talking about. Um, the reason that I, you know, am able to talk about these things is because I, I lived it and I failed and we built 10 things that didn't work. And then I was down on the production floor with a, with a jigsaw cutting out holes because I screwed up my design. And so really, I think that it, it just comes with experience, I suppose. And I fully recognize that. Like, like there, there are, um, everything that I've learned where I'm at today, I learned from others and I learned by failure and I learned by doing that. And I really try to stay focused on the process. And so I, I don't, I don't, um, it doesn't really come up much because I recognize that we others have to go through that process as well. And we all have to go through that process. And the design process itself is, is filled with failure, right? And in the, in the beginning of the design process, you might come up with six ideas and five of them are terrible. 
And, and that's, that's part of the, the process and part of accepting it. What I try to do typically when I interact with others, especially in, in that kind of situation where, you know, maybe they're a little less, less um, experienced or maybe a little bit insecure about, about the situation. You can kind of tell, I try to um, just empower them and make sure that they feel comfortable and, and ready for failure. Right. And, and really say, Hey, we're next, next week, we're going to try this thing and it might break and it's okay. Like the, the big, the most important thing is we tried our hardest and we get, brought our A game to it. And if we did that, then failure is perfectly fine because that's how we get there. And, and so, um, that, that's very much my attitude. And I really try to convey that to others when I work with them. That, that's awesome. Do you enjoy mentoring other engineers? Absolutely. For, for me, um, one of my good buddies put it best. We, he and I worked together at a, a, a robotics company and we would do, build these big robotic systems that needed to be ultra precise. And we had these laser interferometers that even if you breathed on it, it would fail your test, right? Because it's so accurate. And, or, or even, you know, the train would come by every day at one and you had to stop testing because the train's coming by a half a mile away. Um, and so anyway, he, we would have these, these, you'd sit in a room and you'd start the test and you couldn't leave the room because that would ruin the test. And so you're sitting there all day and you're adjusting things and you're getting it just right, doing all your system integration. And then finally, after a whole bunch of work, maybe a week worth of work, it just pops up on the screen pass. And then, and then my buddy's like, you you just stand up and you cheer and you look around and nobody cares. It's this huge <laughs> triumph for you. And you've worked so hard and nobody, nobody even understands the triumph, right? Yeah. Like, like people could pretend to care, but they really don't because they can't because they didn't go through the journey with you. And right. so for me, that's the best part is sharing that journey. And so getting to that point and putting your arms up and then looking around and there's other people with their arms in the air. There's nothing better than that. Oh, what a great feeling. Yeah. 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 Well, let's see. You worked at another place called Oregon Heart, which was a startup where you uh, you were working on the development of an artificial heart. I'm I'm guessing, I could be wrong here. I'm guessing that you probably at least are aware of a company called Syncardia. Yeah. Okay. So they're in our backyard of Tucson. We're just, we're here in Phoenix. Yeah. Um, was, was Oregon Heart a competitor of Syncardia? What, what was different about it? If anything. Yeah, absolutely. So Syncardia goes way back um, and kind of started with some technology that uh, another person I worked for, Dr. Robert Jarvik, started um, at the University of Utah. And um, Syncardia is kind of a, a progression of that. And Syncardia is very much um, a, a wonderful thing. It provides a lot of great benefit. And it's really the only name name in town um, at, at the moment as far as a total artificial heart replacement, um, especially that's actually you know cleared by the FDA and everything. Um, it's entirely pulsatile and is is basically uh, has membranes that, that you implant in, in the body. And then you have tubes that come out and then you have an external pneumatic driver that's an air compressor and then um, essentially sends um, pressure waves of air into the body that move a membrane back and forth. And that coupled with valves pump the blood. So it's a lot like a billows kind of thing. Um, and that uh, technology is very um, it's very robust it's very um, proven and it's been around a long time but it's also really cumbersome there isn't really a great portable option and there's really a lot of um, room for improvement um, and so the Oregon heart is a lot like the other LVADs that, uh, that I've worked on where it's a, a continuous flow pump so it's essentially an impeller a propeller of sorts that spins at a high rpm and is much, much smaller, much, much more implantable. And you have a much smaller battery pack and external driver and everything. So really, it's kind of the next progression of that kind of technology. Got it. Okay. And I understand that uh, you and your team were able to produce a functional prototype within a year, which is really impressive. What uh, what, what kind of prototyping technologies did you all utilize to, to uh, produce this functional prototype within a year so quickly? That's an awesome uh, question. So we... When I started, it, we called it the napkin CAD step. The napkin CAD step, where um, Dr. Wampler, who who founded the company, had a patent and he had a basic idea of how he wanted it to work, and it was based off of some um, hydraulic pumps for the hydraulic system um, world, like you know, big excavators and things like that. And so um, we, and then he had some basic kind of proof of concepts and some three D models that you could show investors, but nothing that that really worked. And so I was hired to figure out: can we make this thing work? How, how does this happen? And uh, just a little bit more detail about the pump. We essentially have a rotating rotor um, that's a, a centrifugal pump um, that rotates within the blood. 
and is hydrodynamic. And so there are no, no bearings, so to speak. It just spins and there's a fluid film of blood that flows around the entire thing. And that's pretty common in the LVAD world. And that's just a single pump. Um, the human heart is actually two pumps, the left side and the right side of the heart. The right side pumps to the, to the lungs, the left side pumps to the rest of the body. And so you have two very different sizes of pumps, very different requirements of pumps. Dr. Wampler's fundamental idea is that you would take a, this propeller, this impeller, and you would shuttle one impeller between two volutes of a pump. So it would pump into the left side for a little bit, and then it pump into the right side. And the benefit of that is you take what are used to be two pumps, and you basically make it much, much smaller, much, mm. much more efficient. And the, the fundamental challenge with that though is, is so you have like C, CFD, um, fluid design software that'll help you design turbos and jet engines and all this. And when you, you use that software and you say, uh, help me, you know, design me a pump with the correct blades and the correct geometry and the volutes and everything for this flow regime which is 200 millimeters of mercury and six liters a minute. And then also I need, I need that pump to also work at a quarter of that pressure, same flow rate. And those are two fundamentally different designs of pumps, right? And so we, we couldn't do that. So we worked through the entire um, process and ended up having different volute designs, same blade design. Um, and then I came up with this control scheme where we essentially feathered how the time that it dwelled in each of those places so that you would uh, essentially almost like PWM, where you would, if, if you wanted more flow in one side, you'd spend more time on that side and you feather that. And so uh, back to, to your actual question, the challenge is how do you prove that? How do you, how do you make that work and prove to people that that's what we should do and move forward? And, um, uh, you know, years ago, you would design a bunch of stuff and machine it and then test it and have this huge long cycle. Well, we um, brought in a couple in-house 3D printers in, into, the, into the place and we started just 3D printing designs. And then we would test them on this test bench where it was just a mock loop where we would circle, circulate glycerin water. And um, when we first hooked it up, um, we had, I affectionately called it the octopus. And there was just tubes everywhere. And they're all just moving it around like crazy. It was like out of, out of a Hollywood movie because our test setup had so much variability and so much compliance where we would never be able to, to truly actually measure our, our product very well. So uh, I took that weekend and, and over, uh, I'm, I'm not even kidding, over about three days, I designed an entire automated test setup. So it was basically like a dynamometer for the pump. Okay. So we would, we would have the artificial heart and we'd put it on our, on our dyno and it had pinch valves and automated valves and flow testing and, and um, also pressure sensors. And it was hooked up to LabVIEW. And so you would just put on um, the, the pump and you push go. And then six hours later, you come back and you have your flow curve, which is called the HQ curve. And that gives us that answer. And so what, what that is, is that's infrastructure, that's design infrastructure. So rather than pay somebody all day to do those tests, now we freed up that person. And so then we built in a process where every week we would come up with a new pump design. We would 3D print it. We'd glue it all together and assemble it. And then we'd put it on this dyno and, we, and we'd push test and then it would give us another graph. And then we would add that to a database um, in MATLAB that would stack up all these graphs over time. And so we could pull out the comparison and the delta between each of these different designs and put it up on, on, on a projector and just actually look and say, let's see design 36 versus 965. And you put them all up there and, it, and you could, you could almost chart the path of where you want to go. Like you knew where you were at and you knew where you'd wanted to go. And you just kept going in the direction that led you there. And the, 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 I think the real innovation there is, is hacking the process by which you do that. Like put, put infrastructure in place for you to be able to do the design and development faster. And, um, traditionally the, the, there's also, they do a lot of CFD work, like computational fluid dynamic simulations with this kind of stuff. And the, the selling point of all that is it's faster and easier and cheaper. And what's so funny is we were working with one of the preeminent um, CFD um, experts in the world for blood pumps. And he had about a one to two week cycle where we would send him a design and then he'd fire up his supercomputers and they'd do their thing. And then a week later, we'd get an answer and we, we could do it faster. And so now it's, it's real data in the real world and we're doing it faster and cheaper. Right. And, and that, that, uh, there were quite a few innovations that, that allowed that to happen. 3D printing getting really good. And then a lot of the other kind of, um, tricks that we do with 3D printing, right. And, and kind of making things and casting things and just kind of little, you know, production hacks to make parts ourselves. And, um, if you put all that together and, and are able to iterate on your design that much quicker, it, it, it changes the whole world really. Uh, that is amazing. That is so impressive. 
Well, I'm going to take a very quick short break here and share with the listeners that TeamPipeline.us is where you can learn more about how we develop or help medical device and other product engineering or manufacturing teams develop turnkey equipment, custom fixtures, and automated machines to characterize, inspect, assemble, manufacture, and perform ver- verification testing on your devices. Now, I'm listening to you, Ian, talk about this test fixture that you developed over the weekend, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, mental note, do not introduce Ian to any of our customers because he will run us out of business all by himself. How how are you able to be so productive? I mean, putting together a test rig like that over the weekend, first of all, most engineers... Uh, at no fault of their own, don't want to spend their weekend designing something like that. They want to go, you know, hang out, spend time with friends, whatever. But you took this weekend and you took it upon yourself to develop this entire test rig over the weekend. What was your mindset uh, like during that time? What what made you think to yourself, I'm just going to knock this out. Yeah, maybe I could do it next week, but I'm going to take the weekend and I'm going to figure this out and, and come Monday, Tuesday, I'm going to have something ready to go. I don't, I don't know if this reflects poorly on me or not, but um, it was because my boss was out of town and I knew he wouldn't want me to do it. <laughs> so I, I just did it. And then and a lot of times it's easier to, to ask for forgiveness and say, look at this thing. It solves the problem as opposed to say, let me do this for a week and I promise you it'll solve the problem. Those are very different conversations. And in this time, it was one of those times where it was, it was time to kind of make it, make it happen or not. So Yeah, that's awesome. Huh? All right. Um, let's see. I'm curious to hear a little bit more about how you work now. So we were talking about when you were working for uh, this company, Oregon Heart, but right now you you have your own business. You, I guess you're do you freelance or or is it uh, a business with you have multiple employees and, and contractors or is it is it just you? How, how are you working nowadays? Yeah, I, I have my own um, business uh, called Nerdian, and basically, uh, in a lot of ways, I'm a, a one man band. Um, most of what I do and most of my business relationships are with other, um, consulting firms and, and can kind of groups of, of freelancers where, um, typically, uh, they are very strong in the software side and they'll have a, a, a product that has a real strong, heavy software component that also has some hardware component to it. And they need those two to talk and interface well. And that, that ends up being a lot of the, the work that I do are, um, kind of those 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 mechanical or hardware projects where you need um pretty good experience and pretty good expertise but you also don't need 50 drafters and engineers to do all the work right and yeah. and and so uh typically also pretty tight integration with software and systems and you know electrical systems and things like that what do you consider your forte these days is it is it mostly mechanical design or is it on the electrical end as well Really, um, I'm a at, at my core, I'm a old school mechanical engineer. Like, there's there's nothing that makes me happier than a flyball governor or like a weird old mechanical des- mechanical mechanism. Um, and but recognizing that as our world progresses, a lot of times we replace complicated mechanical stuff with electronics or or software nowadays. And so, really, um, I think that that's where my 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 true kind of like little kid passion lies is with um, um nitty gritty mechanical design but that being said where i add the most value typically on a lot of these projects is that cross disciplinary um architecture kind of thinking phase where you're really trying to figure out okay there's six different ways we can solve this problem we can divvy it up these different ways how much of it do we do in software how much do we filter out in hardware how how much data do we keep you know all all these kinds of like architectural de- de- decisions and then also, early on with the medical device industry, especially, it's a highly regulated industry. There are a lot of standards, a lot of regulations you need to meet. And a, a lot of times, those the the way that you adhere to those needs to be baked into the design from early on. And that's a little a big pitfall that a lot of, especially folks from outside the, the medical industry fall into when they go making a medical device is you get to a certain point, and you kind of have to redo a bunch of stuff because it wasn't done kind of in, in a way that, that aligns with the standards. And yeah. that's um, a way that I add a lot of value as well is kind of try to try to hack that process and figure out how to bake all that stuff in early. So it's a real smooth process across the finish line. How did you decide that you wanted to start your own company, Nerdian? Uh, what, what was that process like? Sure. Um, so my uh, parents have owned their own jewelry store for over 35 years. And my, and my dad was an entrepreneur um, my my entire life, his entire career. And so it, it kind of started early and, and young with me. Um, I also recognized that you really need to cut your teeth in the industry and get get some sort of skill set that's valuable to folks before you go try to sell that. And so I'm, I am super thankful for my, my time in industry. Um, but there there was a certain point where um, I, I was at Oregon Hard and we were, you know, 
they, they ran out of funding and then people just started calling me to, to do some work on the side or, Hey, can you help me with this? And it just, um, ended up being kind of a natural progression for me. On your website, you state, I am a product designer, mechanical, electrical, and systems engineer, machinist, technician, and tinkerer. At my core, I simply desire to design, invent, and build products that help to make the world a better place. Listening to you speak is very clear to me that you love what you do. You're very passionate about engineering. And we talked a little bit about why did you decide to become an engineer, but what what do you think that passion comes from? Have you ever asked yourself, why is it that I enjoy doing these things so much? The... For for me, so my my grandfather, um, he he grew up in Nebraska, um, but he he was an Oki. He very much had that kind of Oki grapes of wrath story, where um, his, his mother died when he was young, and then his dad lost the farm, and he had a bunch of siblings to take care of. And then once he took care of them uh, to a certain age, he made his way to California because um, he was looking for um, work in the in the orchards picking fruit. And so then he came to California, picked fruit in the orchards and saw an ad in San Francisco to join the sub- submarine force. And he chose to be a submariner because they paid the best. And and so he joined the U.S. Navy as a submariner just before World War II. He was then stationed at Pearl Harbor when the Pearl Harbor attack happened. Um, he was part of um, the Pacific Theater. And then he was also part of the occupation of Japan after after the war. And um, growing up with him... Um, I spent a, a lot of time with him and one of my, one of my good memories of, of, of him is, um, on his back, he had like a back porch that was covered back porch and my grandma got, um, progressively more ill and wasn't able to go up and downstairs to their TV room in the basement. So he enclosed the porch, um, so that they could sit and watch TV together in the evenings. And I was helping my grandpa enclose the porch and he had one of those, uh, three volt cordless drill things, like a, like a black and Decker, $20 cordless, uh, not a cordless drill, but a cordless screwdriver. If you remember those things, it's not drill shaped, it's shaped like a screwdriver. And he had me put the siding on that entire side of the house in wood screws drilled into wood with just this electric screwdriver. And it would run out of batteries after 20 minutes. And then you'd, I'd just be sitting there using it as a screwdriver, screwing it in. And I just remember that that's the kind of person he was, right? Like he, he would just get it done with what he had. Right. And, um, anyway, um, fast, fast forwarding, I was really, really fortunate, um, to, uh, do, do well in high school, get accepted, uh, at the school of mines. And, and, um, my parents were able to take care of my education for me. And I really, um, never lost sight of the fact of, um, how privileged I was to be able to have that happen. And my grandfather started with essentially nothing. I, 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 I apologize. I, I missed part of the story. So after the, after the war, um, he went and worked for Martin Marietta in Colorado and then eventually, um, worked for Lockheed and Martin as part of the Apollo and, and Mercury programs, moved my, moved his family to Florida. And my, um, my mom remembers watching Apollo 11 take off from the back of their station wagon. And then, um, when my, my grandmother was, was passing, she was on her deathbed. I, um, spoke to her a little bit about it. And I said, is it really true that you saw the, the moonshot take off? And then, and she was kind of, you know, in, in, in the grips of dementia at the time, but she instantly woke up, her eyes lit up. She looked me in the face and she says, it still makes my hair tingle. Wow. It was the most incredible thing I've ever seen. And so for my grandfather to go from seemingly really dire circumstances, both, you know, as he was growing up, but then also in the war, I mean, he obviously saw a lot of um, pretty awful things and did not convey any of that to me. Right. Like he, he, anytime that anybody uh, um, was negative in, in any way, especially to like the Japanese folks, he would instantly cut that off. And he, you know, he, he learned the language he shared with us how to eat with chopsticks. Like he was just very, very, um, and he could have done a completely different, gone a completely different direction with that is what I'm going with. And, and then what I'm, what I'm getting at in the end is, is he started with nothing and he was able to move through the ranks and become an engineer at Martin Marietta and then be part of the Apollo moonshot, which is the, most amazing thing. And I, I still have an immense amount of pride that someone in my family was a part of that. Right. And, um, for me to be able to, to say that, you know, I have all these kind of, you know, um, the upbringing that I did, and then I had my college paid for me. And now I have an engineering degree when I'm the age that I am. am, If I didn't do anything meaningful with that, I, I just really, I don't feel, you know, not that he's around anymore, but I don't feel like I could look him in the eye. Right. So I, I'm just, um, 
I hope that answers the question. So. That is an incredibly powerful story. What a, a wonderful man your grandfather was. Thank you for sharing that. I I feel tingles just, I mean, listening to that story. What That's that's really a very powerful story. One of, one of the um, more interesting, almost sounds flippant, but one of the more interesting stories I've heard about where this engineering passion comes from, from an engineer. So thank you again for, for sharing such a personal story. Probably. Um, any advice for engineers who are interested in in going off and uh, doing freelancing on on their own, kind of like you've done? Sure, I can kind of tell my my story. Um, so I knew I you know I had people that wanted to, me to do work for them, and I didn't really know how to build a business or anything. So I um, through a couple like local incubators, business incubators, like um, small business administration stuff. I found a lawyer, and I bought an hour of his time. Uh, like a business lawyer. And I said, wow, I want to start a business. What is, what does this entail? What do I need to do? And then he gave me kind of a list of things that I needed to do. Uh, and then a recommendation for an accountant who's still my accountant to this day. And then I went in and, and did those various things. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm originally from Colorado. My family's still there and it's much easier to incorporate a business in Colorado than California. So I ended up incorporating my business in, in Colorado. Um, and to this day, I'm a foreign entity doing business in California as a Colorado business. <laughs> um, in California, there's, you know, maybe a thousand dollars in fees and some forms you have to fill out and things like that. In Colorado, it's, it's like $30 in one form. Wow. Um, and so it depends on the state you're in. Um, but, uh, uh, I, I would just recommend, you know, finding a few experts that you trust and then buying a little bit of their time and, and then doing that. And then the other really interesting thing is there's a lot of great infrastructure in place now for small businesses. Um, for my um, bookkeeping and, and kind of the, the heart of my business, I use a program called FreshBooks, which is really great for folks that sell their time. Um, it's basically time tracking, invoicing and and um a lot of the, you know, kind of the accounting piece of it, I, I find it much better than, than things like QuickBooks for, for people that sell their time. And then, uh, there are platforms like Gusto for, for your payroll and everything that make all of that a lot easier. And so a lot of the kind of scary stuff that used to be pretty tough. Um, and I remember my dad stressing about sitting down with the checkbook and writing out all the payroll checks for the week or whatever. Um, it's all done in, in a few clicks now if you find those right resources. Um, what I would encourage folks to do is find those partners, find those business lawyers or, or accountants that really um, are geared towards small business. And then also um, make sure to find ones that are not afraid of kind of this new technology and the progressiveness of, of using things like Gusto or FreshBooks in, in that process. Um. I I was thinking the same thing that there are so many tools nowadays that makes business so much easier, almost to the point that if, if I were to start a business 20 years ago with all, all, all these conveniences, I might not even want to do it. It would be just too much of a hassle, too much headache. Another question that came to mind as you were talking about um, FreshBooks and, and that being a great application for folks who, who sell hours, I'm curious to hear your take on uh, fixed price versus time and materials quoting on projects do you have a uh, it sounds like you sell hours so it's probably mostly time and materials but do you have a, a strong preference for for one or the other or just any any philosophy in general behind those two approaches to uh quoting projects absolutely um i think it, it there are different projects that are best for different things so a lot of the stuff that i do is very early um advising kind of stuff where where it's it it would be very difficult to write a fixed budget for for the work it's really kind of helping people figure out what their business plan is how to get through the process how to connect them with the correct people in order to get the thing made and and um come up with a design that works and and meets cost targets and it's really hard to bookend that kind of stuff and and kind of say this is what it'll be because a lot of of what I do is is so cross functional and so kind of product focused. If 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 there's like a chunk of it to say like oh I'll do the industrial design and I'll give you three concepts um, that that's much easier to bookend and that that's that kind of stuff really works well for um, fixed rate. And then there's also a lot of kind of more on the back end like um, I've done a lot of automation stuff where you go into like a a bread factory and they need a whole automation equipment to bake their bread. And that's also, um, you, you end up doing a lot of work on the front end, but that's also pretty straightforward to, to quote because you, you know how many linear feet of conveyor you need and you know which thermal cameras you need and what controls you need. And you can just add all that up plus some, some hourly rate and, 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 um, come up with something clever there. But I, um, most of the work I do, it, it's really, really hard to bookend and, and do on a fixed rate basis. 
Yeah, that makes sense. We find the same thing to be true. If it's a very R&D intensive project, it's really hard to say it's going to be X amount of dollars. But if the project is very well defined, there's a clear scope of work, then it, it becomes a lot easier. Um, uh, I, I'm glad that you mentioned um, uh, fresh books, not because I want to talk about fresh books. Is it is fresh books? Am I saying that right? Okay. Yeah. I know I've heard of it before. Anyway, um, uh, it, you, you mentioned it being a tool, a good tool. What is... Uh, what is one of your favorite engineering tools and what is one engineering tool that you wish you had that just doesn't exist? I mean, my favorite tools are, are SolidWorks, a 3d printer and, and um, you know, raspberry Pis and Arduinos to be perfectly honest. Um, I, I think the, uh, if the world let me, I'd just sit in SolidWorks designing cool stuff all day. I, I really do enjoy that. Um, and then something that I wished existed, I want, I, st- I still want 3D printers that are better. I, I want, I want 3D printers that are more like production materials. I want 3D printers that need less feeding and care. And, and I want, and I want, um, 3D printers with more material options. And I recognize that there are, there are fundamental chal- challenges there. Um, but the, the, change the 3d printing has brought to even just in my career has brought to the process is is really um is huge and it, and if we were able to kind of go to the next level with that and really get like things like uh printed circuit board 3d printing um all these kinds of things kind of kind of dialed in into the next level um i i I think it would only further improve it because that, that a lot of times that's still kind of the, the speed limiting factor is, is getting boards in or getting parts in or like even even today, there's this little thing I want to I want to glue something on this other thing and I'm cutting up pieces of plastic to glue on it when, you know, if I had exactly what I wanted really quick without having to change filament and without having to do all these other things, um, uh, it would it would change a lot for me. All right. I've got one more question for you. What is one of the best ways that you have found to to learn to become and also to learn to ad- advance as an engineer? I uh, YouTube, honestly, has really helped me on a, quite a few occasions and, and sometimes where I've been frustrated in my career and not really sure what to do. And I really encourage folks to just learn things, even if it doesn't apply to the project you're doing, even if it doesn't like bring you an instant return, just seek out information, learn about the Norton bomb site, learn about the, the Manhattan project, learn about Apollo. I have, you know, probably a dozen different books about Apollo and all the details of how they did the systems engineering and all the decisions that went into it. And, and I, I, I really just encourage people to dig into things you're passionate about, even, the, even if it doesn't, you know, give you a direct gain on the, on the project you're on now, just that thinking and kind of looking back on how people did things and, and really, there, there's a lot of really great um, YouTube channels now that have a lot of really great like engineering history and technical history kind of information. Um, that is is it's kind of what um, the Discovery Channel and and the History Channel used to be 20 years ago. <laughs> That's really great advice. I also love YouTube. Um, Ian, I think we're we're gonna wrap it up here. Before we do, is there anything else that we should talk about that we haven't hit on yet? Um, I, I just, uh, the one thing that I would encourage folks to look into are, uh, again, like history of engineering and really start to research and understand the process of doing engineering. And so there's a great uh, Russian problem solving method called trees, T-R-I-Z, um, that's super interesting and has a lot of really great ideas that a lot of us just kind of do innately anyway, but it actually codifies it and makes it, you know, and and it probably will give you some new ideas when you're stuck. And then also, um, Dieter Rahms is, is almost my, he's my hero. And, and especially in, in modern design, we, we start to think about folks like Johnny Ives and these other IDO and these places like that. And really all that started with Dieter Rahms. And so if you dive into the B Braun stuff and Dieter Rahms and the history of his work, um, it's really inspiring. It's really cool stuff. And then also way ahead of its time. And then also one of the, the things that I've really learned a lot from is uh, Sun Tzu's The Art of War. And I know it's kind of cliche to talk about that, especially in the business side, but on the engineering side and the infrastructure of doing work, of doing engineering, of manufacturing, there's so many great little nuggets in there that really apply to, to this world as well. Great recommendations. Thank you so much for all of that. Well, Ian, this has been awesome. What a, what a treat it's been to talk to you and get to know you a little bit and hear your story. Thank you again for 
for sharing all of this. And uh, I'm just so appreciative and grateful for your time today. Thank you so much. Likewise. I'm Aaron Moncur, founder of Pipeline Design and Engineering. If you liked what you heard today, please share the episode. To learn how your team can leverage our team's expertise developing turnkey equipment, custom fixtures, and automated machines, and with product design, visit us at teampipeline.us. Thanks for listening.